Good afternoon, Professor Shankar. I'm very happy to have a chance to talk to you about the topic uh, of um, psychiatry for intellectual disability and the issue of medication. And uh, I know that you were one of the uh, people who were behind the initiative STOMP, uh, one of the psychiatrists who designed uh, this national initiative. So can you explain me a little bit uh, why did you decide to start with this topic and why uh, you think the overmedication is the issue that should be addressed in the health and social system? Uh, uh, thanks, Peter, for inviting me for uh, contributing to this. So I think uh, one of the big challenges historically has been that uh, people with intellectual disability and or autism, uh, it has been difficult to understand why they get distressed. And uh, a quick and easy response, which might not be the right response, has been to prescribe them psychotropic medication with the consideration that it might be mental illness or calming or behavioral issues. Now, obviously, when uh, one of the when when in, in UK definitely we closed down our institutions and we got people back into their local communities with their own care teams, and uh, there was a learning and research which went alongside them, which sort of suggested that while it's obviously right in principle that people come back to their communities, to their own families and others, but living there and living with your own families and carers is quite challenging. Yeah. I, if it give us give some thought to that, even me living with my own family, it with with my kids and everything and the, and my wife and everything, there are there are times when you you it really gets on your nerves. You really want to sort of you get annoyed. There is happiness. There is sadness. Lots of things, and when we think about the context of the individual with intellectual disability, at times they can't. Uh, provide suitable cognitive abilities to process what might be going on and also and or they might have whiplash behaviors in which they might not be able to show their anger or frustration in a social manner. Now what tends to happen is we end up medicalizing this because it's easy and try to give it drugs to sort it out. Of course there is a higher representation of people with intellectual disability uh, with regard to mental health problems in them around three times more. But when we when there was a big data, one of my colleagues, Rory Sheehan and his colleagues looked into the big data analysis. And what we found was that 17% of people with intellectual disability were being prescribed antipsychotics compared to around 3% who had a mental illness which deserved it. So there was this big gap. And one out of three people with intellectual disability were actually on a psychotropic medication, like an antidepressant or something. And clearly, what it showed is that this there is a significant problem where we are medicalizing uh, social behavior, where in the context where people might be getting distressed or might even be reacting inappropriately, we are deciding it's mental illness or we are deciding it's we need to drug them up. The second challenge which happened was Yes, you gave somebody drugs at the time when they were distressed. Say you're moving somebody, say their parent, mother died. They're distressed. They're upset. They're banging their head. You put in some medication. The challenge that's been there is who's reviewing it and who's taking it off in due course after six weeks or three months. Is it getting reviewed and why not? And the reason for that is people are remaining on these drugs and that's then causing them a lot of side effects. Sooner or later, the positive effects of these drugs tend to get overcome by the negative effects of the drugs. And we know that that's because these drugs can cause, they're very powerful drugs and they can cause harm in by causing diabetic symptoms, metabolic symptoms, bone problems, lots of things emerge. And nobody's keeping an eye on that, which brings it to a third thing, which is basically that a good thing is that people are living longer. But if they are going to be on these drugs, they're not going to be living longer well. So they'll be having a lot of care problems, which obviously causes them more likely to get distressed, more likely to be presented for behavioral issues, more likely for the same drug or other drugs to be added. So in a way, that's a vicious circle and a perpetuating circle, which we wanted to show spotlight on. 
Then the fourth thing which comes up is economics. Even if we are cynical about the good effects and all the things of this drug, forget that. The challenge which is there is that the burden, an average person with intellectual disability has around 12 conditions. And if some of these are acquired and they are living badly, there is a huge cost to the state to support them, to treat them and to care for them. That shouldn't be in the equation, but it's still there. And the fact that people with intellectual disabilities are five times more likely to end up in emergency departments uh, than say the general population for preventable issues, which could be managed in community. So it could be things like toothache, tooth problem, pain, anything, seizures, these things which can be managed if you get the right support and treatment in community are not happening, end up in ED where you get patched up, you spend more money because EDs are expensive and you get less care. So it doesn't make sense. So these were all the challenges which we sort of found out. And I guess what also people have to appreciate is that this is not that it's not Rome wasn't built in a day. So this is not something which happened within a few years. This has been over generations where people have been put on medication. So on one hand, you have to educate the new doctors and other people, clinicians who are coming through so that they can be very mindful about these issues and equally work with the population which is already on drugs to see how best we can unhook them and support them off it. Now, there is another big challenge because when they got put on the drugs, they would have had a need. And it might be that need might have been something like bereavement. It might have got met. That's fine. And they moved on. But if that need was, say, housing, and you put them on the drug because they don't like the space that they are in, and they're a bit sedated, and that's what's holding them, you take off the drug, the housing need hasn't gone. So they're going to still be aware of the problem, and they're still going to the need still exists and their behaviors will continue until you sort that need. And that brings the fact that you actually have to bring in the right people who can meet that need, which is from social care, occupational therapy. We don't know. But, and it is about meeting those needs. And do you want to sort of take off the plug and leave it? But where does where you need to substitute it with something else? And that's where we are wrestling at the moment because we are very clear that we want to do this, but you can't do it and walk off because the need re-emerges. And people say, oh, you took the person off the drug. So look, they're again behaviorally uh, activated or they're upset again. Put them back on the drug. Yeah, but actually the answer is somewhere else. You need to give them the right support, the life lifestyle, get them out for walks and community. And of course, I mean, you give them a drug and make them sit in front of TV is an easier option, but it's not the right option. Yeah, it's very, it's very clear to me. So uh, th this means that you have to have um, the system of positive behavior support uh, yeah. to address the needs uh, when you put down the drugs, because these two are, are connected, uh, I understand. Uh, was it uh, because um, uh, STOMP is official initiative of NHS, is that right? Yeah. So was it, was it hard to persuade the people who decide that this this topic uh, is is good to address or or is it is is a way uh, to so I think uh, Stomp Stomp's a great umbrella. It's a big broad church which allowed people to sort of bring their ambitions and thoughts together, and different organizations from charities to patient organizations to professions like psychiatry, everyone to come under that to say we need to do something about it. So it it was a good tool gatherer. The challenge with Stomp has always been that it doesn't have its own resources, which will help drive the change. So what I mean by that is it, if I am going to now, there is a backlog of people who are all settled well, who are all on various drugs. Now, if I have to go around taking them off their drugs, it's not a simple matter where I say, stop the drugs, because you can't, you don't know what, what has happened and how which means that a lot more time has to be spent either through the multidisciplinary team to evidence, baseline, change. And on an average, it takes around up to six months to withdraw somebody off medication, provided they don't uh, wobble. In this, there are also people who require those medication. We don't know who they are. 
And only when we start taking them out, then suddenly you start seeing symptoms appear, which then you need to sort of tightly clasp down. There is the challenge with regard to care providers and families, because they're all very afraid that, well, if something re-emerges, they would have seen the person at the worst when they would have been quite distraught. And it, it's, a, it's a memory which people can't let go, seeing their sons, daughters, brothers in a terrible state where they have not been eating, tearing clothes, banging their head. They never want them to go back there. Mm -hmm. They understand that the drugs might be causing harm. But the first question is, what happens if he get, becomes or he or she becomes the same as he was five years ago? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't answer that he might not become. <laughs> and that's the challenge. How do you put in safeguards? How do you change people's thinking to be supportive and positive? What are the offers there? And that means that there is a lot of planning that goes on, which means that those that planning, whether it be from social care, the doctor's time, pharmacist, all that requires extra resources. Mm -hmm. So that never got mentioned within the larger ambit of STOM. So we tried to do STOM along with our normal day-to-day -day job. So I think that's always a challenge. And I think that's where you now the thinking of the larger policy makers is going that we need to offer something more to deliver stomp and stamp. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I also communicated to one of your colleagues uh, called uh, Show Me Depp, Sumitra yeah, Depp. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know Show Me very well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he sent, he sent me some, some papers about the um, uh, evidence uh, of, of un, uh, uh, antipsychotics uh, and psychotropic medicines to the behavior management. Yeah. And it, it looks like it's quite poor. There is no, not much uh, much evidence that it really yeah. works. Uh, no. Tell me something about that. So basically, uh, the research evidence about whether antipsychotics or any other psychotropics for behavior is quite limited and very poor. The challenge which we have is that something like challenging behavior, the term that we use, or behaviors that challenge or distress behaviors, is a very subjective term. So today morning, if my son refuses to eat his cornflakes because it's of a different brand, that's challenging to me. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenging behavior. Mm -hmm. So it's a very subjective phenomena. And when you encounter that, it's quite interesting that different people have different views of it. So it's not a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So when you treat a concept, you can go, this is exactly where it's classical, where when you're treating a behavior, what are you treating? If the behavior is emergent from a mental disorder, like psychosis or depression, of course, give antidepressant or give an antipsychotic. But you're not treating the behavior per se, you're treating the condition. Mm -hmm. But where we have shifted is we have ended up starting to treat behavior without thinking about what the background diagnosis is. But it's easy to say, well, oh, we should find out what the diagnosis is and then treat. But usually, when you get to hear of the person, the person's usually ripping the wall or banging somebody, it's this thing, or there's a lot of aggression and violence. So you can't actually get into that. And there is no way you can assess the person. You have to go with what you're seeing cross-sectionally. And you then start treating the behavior with the drugs that you hope will treat something. Mm -hmm. And it's like shooting in the dark at times. Mm -hmm. So I think the science of behavioral uh, assessments and how they link in, especially acute ones, require more evidence-based and evol evolution. Because it's also things like, say, pain. If there is a non-verbal person who's in pain, how do you understand that, that you're not diagnostically overshadowing? What if there were seizures? What if their behaviors was actually partial seizures where they're reacting to some stimuli and scared about it? Mm -hmm. What if it is past trauma and some some episode has made them remind them of what's happening and they react to it. We, because we only get half the story or less than half the story, we treat the behaviors. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the big question is, what are we treating? If we are scientists, we always need to find a way to address uh, and logically approach the problem. And I think that's failing in this situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when when I re read the nice guidelines that, that that are made for challenging behavior, that there's written that the, you have to assess the psychological behavior and, and environmental factors before you medicate. Is that is that right? And is it something that is uh, sure. common in the UK today? <laughs> so basically, the nice also has a 
has an exception to that where uh-huh. if the risk is very high yes. so if somebody is running behind someone with a knife or something yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't have to wait for the <laughs> psychological and things you basically the risk issues will dominate so it's almost like you have if you think of it it's time versus risk mm-hmm. so if you have say time you can actually do the things i think it's sort of in in theory it's very good mm-hmm. the nice is it's it's very good to actually use that so it's it's basically like 10 commandments you are expected to follow it good but mm-hmm. all of us follow it to a more or less different degrees mm-hmm. but you aspire to follow it but here the key challenge which is there is you have in resources so for example in uk beds the specific num- beds for people with id and and uh, learning disabilities we have shrunk them considerably Mm-hmm. so what that means is that any assessment which has to happen in crisis will happen in the community which is good and bad because in community you can see where the person setting and what's changed and how but the bad about it is it's not a safe enough place at times you don't have trained nurses who are there 24 by 7 you don't have access to the legal ways of restricting somebody like giving them sedation by injections etc to keep them calm while you do the assessments so there is all this quid pro quo and what then tends to happen is you tend to go towards more about safety and treating the risk at times, not the Ill, not the causes, but the risk. And that can lead to, as I said, the, the common dilemma is you say, okay, I'm going to give this person six weeks of a psychotropic. Let's see what happens. So the person settles mainly because they find that it's a toothache. The dentist sees the person urgently, the tooth's removed. So six weeks later, you say, should we remove the medication now? And everyone goes, no, 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 no. It's just after six weeks now we have had such a traumatic time and he has had such a traumatic time. We don't want you to upset anything. So then you say, okay, well, if he's so settled, I can't keep seeing him again and again. There's enough work to do. So we'll discharge him. And then you see the person again three years later in crisis. He'll still be on the same medication. Save this thing because no one else has removed it or withdrawn it. So there is a legacy issue which builds in. Yeah. These are the things which we encounter mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so and can you generalize how successful stop initiative is so do, do you have uh, some numbers uh, of medication putting down some some new researches uh, if you if you if you can tell something about that so we've had uh, mixed successes so i can tell you that and uh, so basically the big focus over the last seven eight years has been primarily antipsychotics so with regard to antipsychotics the big data which has shown that it was around 17% and that's come down to around 15%, which is good. I mean, nationally, not only does it mean that people have been taken off, new medication, new prescribing has come down in that. So we, have, it's, we are looking at a national population here uh, and uh, we you are talking of thousands and thousands of people. So 15% good stuff in seven years moving in the right direction. But... This is where some of my research comes in is that we looked at antidepressants Mm -hmm. in the same period that has gone up by three times. Mm -hmm. So then we looked at seizure, anti-seizure medication for non-seizure related prescribing in people with ID Mm -hmm. that has gone up significantly. Mm -hmm. The combined medication. So basically where you have anti-seizure medication and antidepressant, what I call a kitchen sink treatment hit everything and hope something works sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's gone up. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, yes, we can take credit for reducing antipsychotic prescribing, but have we ended up robbing Peter to pay Paul by increasing the antidepressant prescribing, anti-seizure prescribing? Basically, have we ended up robbing Peter, John and Matthew to pay Paul, which is the antipsychotic prescribing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, in in a general uh, GP on psychiatrist mindset, uh, the idea that the drugs should not be the first then option is growing, or is it more common? Yes, than it I think in 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 the UK, I mean, in definitely in England, uh, psychiatrists totally are of the view that for behavioral issues, drugs, psychotropic drugs, should not be the primary treatment. But the problem that comes in, so that that philosophy is totally there. I mean, if you were to sort of ask, there are around 300 
specialists in this area. You ask 300 of them, I'd be surprised if all 300 basically don't say, of course, you shouldn't use it. That's it. Mm -hmm. So it's in theory and in principle, that's it. Mm -hmm. But the problem is in practical. Pra in, in real life, it's quite grubby. At four o'clock on a Friday, when you get a call to say that somebody is breaking down the their house, the provider wants to give notice. So the question is, do you section and send the person to hospital 300 miles away? Or do you give a drug to keep that person calm over the weekend so that everyone can get together on Monday morning mm -hmm. to then discuss what next? Yeah. Everyone, including their own families, will say, please, please, don't send him uh, this person away. Just try to do something. Get this tidied over. And on Monday morning, you do something. New provider, new this thing. Get the person into new setting. Two weeks later, everything's calmed down. But nobody wants the drug yet removed. That's what the situation is. Oh, they were all been so exhausted with that crisis management. You just want peace and calm for a while. Yeah. So, And the individual themselves might or might not have a say. They might actually say that, look, the drug's actually working because they see the effect of possible. They don't see the effect of the change around them. But see, because they're taking a drug, they might say, well, this is working for me. Mm. So they might attribute it to that drug, their change. So which misattribute it in a way. And so it, in a way, it sort of works to everybody to just go away then, having managed the crisis. So I think that is the practicality of life in a way which we are facing as psychiatrists. So in theory, we know that this is not good, but in practice, you're pushed. And that's the reason why I think instead of antipsychotics, people are moving towards antidepressants or anti-seizure medication, anything that can help keep people calm. Sort of thing. Okay. Thank you. So good luck for the future and thank you very much for the interview. No problem at all. And if you need anything from me, uh, any any of my dodgy research or anything. We just published a paper today, actually, on mm -hmm. uh, on uh, attitudes towards this. So let me know. Very happy to help. Mm -hmm.